Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we can come together over such a wide distance for many of us uh, to study your word. I pray that you open your word to us that we can hear and understand and that we can then go forward and share your word with others. I pray that it be a blessing to us this evening and through the week and that we meditate on it as we go about our daily lives. I ask you these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week we gave a pretty long introduction to Revelation and we're not quite done yet. Uh, we got one more section to go on the introduction. We're going to talk a bit about the different genres used in Revelation, as well as its unique use of language. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the Christology, which is the study of Christ in the book of Revelation. Uh, its central theme of worship, and also its secondary theme of judgment. So we're going to talk about those today and give a hopefully a more brief introduction on those. So three of the primary genres found in the book of Revelation are epistolary, prophetic, and apocalyptic. Now those are probably gibberish to most, I know they were at me, for me at first. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at them and spend some time on apocalyptic, but just briefly go over epistolary and prophetic. So the epistolary genre in the book of Revelation, we find at the beginning of the book, uh, the letters to the seven churches. Uh, epistolary is a special genre of letter. So we see those at the beginning of the book of Revelation and again at the end when John is signing off. Uh, so we look at epistolary, it has a few different characteristics that we can uh, trace. So epistolary basically just means logical discourse. It's a letter written it for a specific purpose in a specific order to bring understanding. So I'll read this for us. It's from Roy B. Zuck's book. He wrote the Believer's Bible Commentary, or not that, Bible Knowledge Commentary. Um, he is a Dallas seminary guy. So logical discourse. This genre of biblical literature is also called epistolary literature and refers to the epistles of the New Testament, Romans through Jude. The epistles generally include two kinds of material, expository discourse, which seeks to expose uh, understanding, uh, which expounds certain truths or doctrines, often with logical support for those truths and hortatory discourse, which includes exhortations to follow certain courses of action or to develop certain characteristics in light of those truths presented in the expository discourse material. So when we get to the seven churches, which should be probably the middle or end of January, we will be talking about this expository material, how Paul or not Paul, John will set out a, an exhortation to these churches but it's based on a logical discourse of um, you've done this right, you've done this wrong, therefore go forward and do it this way. And that's the same pattern that we see through the other epistles that have been written. Uh, in form, the epistles usually begin by naming the author. And we see that in the book of Revelation, John does name himself. Uh, the recipients, the person or persons being addressed the words of greeting and often, though not always, expressions of thanks for some aspect of the reader's conduct or character. The epistles obviously differ from private letters in that they are presented as messages from God with some of the writers directly affirming that they were writing under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. The material is given with apostolic authority, meaning that not just anyone can write an epistle, but it's those directly within one step of Jesus Christ who had met him, spoken with him, or in some way been connected to Christ. And the material is intended to be read in the churches. Many of the epistles were addressed to specific local groups of believers or individuals. Uh, so the, the seven letters to the churches are mini epistles, but in every case they fit all of these criteria of epistle. 
So we do see epistolary genre in the book of Revelation. Uh, and what we'll notice as we go through Revelation is it's a tapestry of all sorts of genres. We're only going over three of them, uh, but we're going to see him in there. We're going to see poetry. Uh, it will quote from the Old Testament quite often. Um, so these are just the major three. Okay, prophetic literature is kind of the overall genre of the book. And packed inside that prophetic genre is ap uh, apocalyptic. So think of prophetic as the over, overarching genre and apocalyptic as a subgenre of that. So prophetic literature is material that includes predictions of the future at the time of writing the material. So for example, we have lots of prophetic material in the Old Testament but much of it is already fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. But that genre is still prophetic because at the time that it was written, it had not yet come to pass. Uh, predictions of the future, da -da. Injunctions often included that those who hear the prophecies adjust their lives in light of the predictions. In the Old Testament, for example, the people of Israel were told to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So we're not just given information to satisfy our interests, uh, but to guide us towards a more deeper faith, to uh, lead us to follow Christ in our day-to-day -day walk. When we understand the closeness of the time of his coming, uh, we want to be found about his business at his return. So it's, it's not just to, uh, to give us one up on everyone else who doesn't know the future, it's actually to guide our hearts closer to him uh, and see repentance from sin often accompanied predictions about the Lord's return and accompanying events. Uh, I will highlight this as we go through it. Uh, together with prophetic uh, messages is almost 100% of the time accompanied with a therefore sin no more sort of message. So we're, we're given these prophetic messages for specific purpose um, to uh, guide us towards sanctification in our Christian walk. And D, special form of prophetic literature is apocalyptic material, which focuses specifically on the end times while presenting the material in symbolic form. So that's really the driving difference between apocalyptic and just simply prophetic genre is that apocalyptic fo focuses specifically on the end times. So the pro prophecies about Christ's first coming were not apocalyptic because um, we learned after the fact that this is not end times prophecies, but prior to a parenthetical period of the church. The apocalyptic messages of those prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah don't come until after the church. So let's look at, at apocalyptic literature. We're going to look at about, let's see, is it six different aspects of apocalyptic literature? Uh, we're going to see the meaning, the occasion in which it's used. Uh, it comes primarily in visions. It's very symbolic. And an angel is often accompanying this message as an interpreter because there are symbols. And it relays information about the distant future. So I'll read this. A large portion of the prophetic literature of the Bible records what the prophets saw in visions. These portions are often referred to as apocalyptic. Portions of Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and much of Revelation are apocalyptic. Apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, translated revelation. In Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, uh, translated revelation in Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. An apocalypse then is a disclosure from God. So this apple plus, uh, is it, calypsis. Calypsis is the word for a veil in, Revel in Greek. And apo is the coming away from. So we're removing the veil so that we can see behind God's veil of um, his plan for future history. Most apocalyptic literature was written by prophets when they were out of the land of Israel. 
Ezekiel and Daniel were in Babylon, and the Apostle John was on the island of Patmos. So a lot of the apocalyptic literature deals specifically with Israel in the end time. So that's what we're going to see as a major theme in Revelation. Um, and many try to put the church into Revelation, but that causes a lot of theological issues. So we're, we're going to let the text speak for itself and recognize it in its genre that this is generally dealing with Israel while they're outside of their land and uh, not seeing those fulfilled promises that they know God will be faithful to fulfill in the end times. So thinking similarly along the lines of Daniel and Ezekiel as they were in captivity in Babylon, so Israel is still in captivity in a way in this world where she's not um, rec she's not received yet her promises from God. Besides being given in times of exile or Gentile oppression, apocalyptic literature has four other characteristics. It consists of prophecies given in elaborate visions. It includes many symbols. An angel was often seen in the vision and frequently gave interpretations and it includes messages regarding the distant future. Okay, so hopefully that's a good introduction to apocalyptic literature. We're gonna look at some of the specific language used in the book of Revelation. We'll look at metaphorical language, visions, symbols, and numbers. So we're gonna dive a little deeper into some of those aspects of apocalyptic literature. So metaphorical language. Uh, most of us probably remember what a metaphor is from middle school language arts. Uh, metaphor and simile are very similar. A simile says that something is like another thing, but not exactly the same. Whereas a metaphor draws a closer contrast between those saying that two things are identical, though it's obvious that they are not. Uh, so I'll read this from figures of speech in the Bible. A declaration that one thing is or represents another or comparison by representation. So again, metaphor comes from the Greek language, meaning metaphora, which is a transference or a carrying over or across. So we're dragging the meaning of one thing into another thing so we can more clearly understand it. Often this is dragging a spiritual concept into a physical one that we're more easily able to comprehend. So meta from beyond or over and foreign from to carry. We may call the figure representation or transference. Hence, while the simile generally states that one thing is like or resembles another thing, the metaphor boldly and warmly declares that one thing is another thing. While the simile says all flesh is as grass, the metaphor carries the figure across at once and says, all flesh is grass. So we're missing that as that gives it a bit of separation. This is the distinction between the two. The metaphor is therefore not so true to fact as the simile, but is much truer to feeling. The simile says, all we like sheep, while the metaphor declares that we are the sheep of his pasture. So in the book of Revelation, we're going to see much higher frequency of metaphor than simile. And we have to understand this in a Jewish context because this book was written to a Jewish audience. Uh, and it is very much in kind with the earlier Old Testament books of prophecy. Uh, we mentioned last time that many of the Reformation uh, theologians dismissed this book because it wasn't like the New Testament. So they, they thought it was removed too far from its time. Uh, this book harks back to Old Testament prophets. Okay, we'll keep going. So visions, uh, here's two examples of visions that we'll see in the book of Revelation uh, pretty early on. We'll see seven golden lampstands and we'll see the seven stars. And those are both interpreted in the text for us. So we'll see that the seven golden lampstands represent the seven churches. We'll see that the seven stars are the seven churches. 
So when symbols or metaphors are presented for us in scripture, uh, they're almost always interpreted for us by the angel giving the vision or by some other clue in the text. If it's left uninterpreted, uh, we can figure some of it out based on the audience, but it's not incumbent on us to discover every symbol or metaphor if it's not interpreted for us. Um, some of those things will come to light at the time when these, uh, this apocalypse is, is actually coming to pass. An example of that would be the Mark of the Beast 666. There's a lot of argument and disputation about what exactly that means. And my understanding of that is that it's not something that we will come to a complete understanding of, but those during that time will see it, recognize it, and understand it. So it's not necessarily written for us, though we can conjecture about it, but it's not something that we ought to split up about because it's not interpreted for us in the text. Okay, and this is just a review then of the uh, language used in apocalyptic literature that it's given in the time of exile, uh, that it consists of prophecies of elaborate visions, including symbols. Angels often give the interpretation and these messages regard the distant future. Okay, now we've got a bit of an exercise. I've got eight different symbols up on the screen and take a minute to see how many you recognize and whether or not you can come up with a linguistic equivalent of it. So is there some word that this symbol brings to mind? Uh, the first one's actually harder than I intended it to be. So if anyone has a guess about what this symbol means. Don't. Don't. Yeah. Don't. It can also mean wrong way. Um, yeah, don't often, go. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I noticed though when I looked up pictures of wrong way is it'll often say in it wrong way. So this is symbol for us in the real world is interpreted because it's not often understood immediately. We understand that it's a negative and don't, but unless it says wrong way, we might not know exactly what we are doing wrong. Uh, how about the next one? That one might mean, that, uh, that first one might mean no parking in certain it could be no countries, <laughs> which is not fair. <laughs> a bit, and if the white spaces turn blue, that's in England the, the sign for the metro. Oh, okay. So that, that wouldn't mean no, and it's just a little bit different. But I remember when I went to England and I saw that sign for the first time and it had nothing written on it. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Their wrong way signs are nowhere near a one-way street. <laughs> that was not the case. Well, um, I just quickly, just simply uh, can look uh, similar to something that we understand, but that's not how it's understood in its social context. Uh, so symbol number two, I think this one's a little easier. Is that yield? That would be the yield sign. Uh, I don't have an example of where that's used differently anywhere, but we have a word that we know that this symbol represents. Uh, how about the next one? Parking. Park. Mm -hmm. Park. Parking. And the next one? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> a bike path or biking bike path. Or bikes or something it's yeah. yellow so that means caution I should say bikes. bikers yeah yeah so we, we can do a bit of interpretation on this sign if it were a white sign we might not regard it as a caution sign but the yellow lets us know in our culture that this is caution uh here in korea their caution signs are orange not mm. not yellow uh, okay, down here again on the left. Handicap. Handicap. Or, or as my husband would say, um, maybe I shouldn't share. He calls it <laughs> the big butt sign. That opens up a few possibilities for me. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I, I remember as a kid, I didn't know what this sign meant. Um, my mm -hmm. great uncle came to visit for Christmas and they hung this in the, the window we could park earlier. Uh, I think that was the first time I saw this and I thought it was a unicycle. I, oh. I, 
Uh, okay, the next one. Hazardous. Hazardous. Often specifically like biohazard. Uh -huh. Okay, what about this one? Justice. 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 Yeah, it can sometimes be law, but we know these are the balanced scales of justice. So our specific word that we could draw to that is justice. And this is pretty unique to our Western culture. And what about the last one? Infinity. Infinity. Yeah. Or HM. Okay. Does it mean something though as a sign in public? No, Race I think track. <laughs> racetrack. I mean, if you see this on the street, <laughs> it might make more sense that maybe there's a racetrack near rather than this road goes on forever, unless you're going through Montana, then that might, be, <laughs> that might be the case. I have a quick uh, sign story. Uh, um, in Europe, a green plus sign means it's the pharmacy. That's where you go. That tells you that's a pharmacy. Well, my brother-in-law, uh, who's lived in Africa for decades, came here and his son needed some medicine. So he went to the green plus sign store <laughs> on the island, which is now the sign here for marijuana. <laughs> yeah. That would be, be a good one to have. <laughs> it's a different kind of medicine. <laughs> Not for like a five-year-old. <laughs> Well, they appropriated, <laughs> they appropriated, they call it, appropriated the European sign for pharmacy. Exactly. Well, here's one that's probably not PC, but um, the swastika in Asian cultures is the sign for hospital. Oh, really? Wow. wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's the hospital it. here has a big swastika on the side of it. And it, it always catches my eye as I go by, but for them, it's, completely innocuous. It has no bad connotation to it. Really? Interesting. Okay, let's let's amp it up a bit and see if we can do these ones. Does anyone have a guess about this first sign? If you saw this on the street, what would you do? Oh my gosh. Is it is it the runway? Angled right? <clears throat> No, it's not angled correctly. I couldn't get a good angle on this one. So is it I like a skateboarding? I, I didn't, so I had to go on Google to find one. <laughs> is it, Kelly said skateboarding. <laughs> it's not skateboarding. Is it a crosswalk and a stop at the same time? No, this is actually a, a Chinese symbol that the Japanese use. Oh. It, it's their um, kanji for stop. Interesting. They, they don't always put a red stop sign on the street because here's the word for stop. So if you see this in Japan, you might not know that you need to stop unless you've learned that. In fact, I learned that only the last time I went to Japan that that's what that meant. Uh, so the culture, it's incumbent upon that culture to whom that symbol is directed to interpret that symbol. So I mean, we came up with a couple of different interpretations, skateboarding or crosswalks being some, uh, but it's, it's not up to us to decide what that means in that culture. We have to let them interpret it. How about the next one in the middle? If you saw this sign on the side of a building in Japan, would you go in? To get coffee, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at it and I thought it kind of looked like bread. Uh, but this, this is the sign in Japan for sauna. Yeah. So if you see this, it's going to be a, a sento or a, what's their other word? Um, some, some of them are nude saunas also. So you probably don't just want to walk in for a cup of coffee. <laughs> you might be a shocked. Uh, okay. How about the last one here? No idea. <laughs> you saw this well. Looks like a sword. Right. It doesn't work as well because uh, because of the makeup of our group here. But I was going to ask if you'd go through this curtain if you saw it in Japan. Uh, actually, most of you probably could. This is the curtain for a women's bathroom. Ah, for a what? Women's bathroom in Japan. But I didn't know that the first time I went in, so I was glad to have a Japanese person with me who could say, <laughs> don't go through that one, go through the other one. Because ah. 
also these cultures don't have a distinction distinction between blue and pink for male and female. Uh, pink is not specifically a female color. Here they use the orange, which to me is caution in Japan. But um, for them, that's the female color is orange. And you'll often get something like red for male. So not much of a difference, but for them, it's quite a big difference. Wow. Okay. I, mean, take, I, did, I was in a Muslim country and went into the men's bathroom accidentally. What? Yeah. Probably the worst places in a Muslim country as a woman going into the men's bathroom. <laughs> I don't have any signs. There were any signs. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I survived. <laughs> and he gets down. It can be a, an interesting experience to see how differently they think. And it, um, you really have to be willing to understand things differently. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to do as we go through Revelation, is we have to be willing to understand some symbols differently than what we would naturally interpret them as in our American culture. Okay, let's do the last one. This popped up a lot for me this last spring and oh. I had no idea That's what it meant, but all my students- Which for help me or help, help you help me. Yeah, it's a sign language for help, I believe. Um, I didn't know what it was representing, similar to the tattoos people have been getting with the semicolons. Uh, symbols, even in a culture that you're living in, can pop up and develop over time. Uh, this one is the sign of solidarity for coronavirus victims. Oh, really? Yeah. I was going to say, that's odd that they're doing an American Sign Language symbol in their country. So mm -hmm. that and uh, they'll, they'll do that quite often, even with our language. They will take words from English into Korean and totally dislocate it from its original meaning. Uh, and find some obscure translation of it. And that becomes their word for it in Korean. I don't have exactly a, um, a reference point, but it was very difficult for me being at a church here in Korea because they would latch on to English words that had a totally different meaning than what they were going for. But they adapted it into Korean or Koreanized English and it became their word for um, Something, for example, they have their 247 mission. And everyone at my church is talking about their 247 mission. And everyone's asking me, how are you coming on your 247 mission? Without a translation of that reference, I had no idea that they were talking about world evangelization for the 247 nations. Oh, huh. An obscure symbol for me. But for them, the entire church was on board with that, probably from a prior sermon to a time that I wasn't at this church. So um, even in our cultures that we're living in, symbols pop up. And a year ago, this would not have been interpreted for coronavirus, but now we see it and we have a new interpretation of it. So we also have to locate these symbols in their time. So we, we can't draw a symbol that developed in the second or third century in the Middle East. We have to actually go back to at that time what was it understood as? Uh, so hopefully those are a few examples to show us kind of what the burden is for the interpreter of scripture. What does a semicolon mean in a tattoo? I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe that is in solidarity for suicide. Oh, really? um, oh. I'm not exactly sure, but I think a semicolon tattoo is in recognition or remembrance of a friend or relative loved one who's committed suicide. Well, okay, so that draws um, a memory that for cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. is the a tattoo of the number 69 across a, a bouquet of roses. Interesting. Because it sounds 60, 69 roses is ah. cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you don't know that, you might interpret that as something quite different. Yeah. Uh, yes. So be careful, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here is our, uh, these are kind of four rules for interpreting symbols when we come across them in scripture. Uh, symbols are given with a definite meaning in mind. They are not vague to the writer. 
uh, the writer will have some sort of an idea, but it's perhaps difficult to communicate with the linguistic restrictions in that culture. Uh, oftentimes, Paul will say that he is writing in a human sense for us to understand. Uh, this isn't saying that he's inhuman, but it's saying that the understanding he's come to through the Holy Spirit is difficult to put into human language. Uh, it's, it is interesting that even in the Greek language, uh, which is quite developed. I think they had something like eight different words for love, all different unique flavors. There's four main ones that I think we hang on to, but um, there are a few more that are very slight differences that we don't recognize. Uh, so even, even with this very developed and complex language, it's still difficult for him to communicate these uh, eternal truths. So symbols often carry that information uh, into our language for us, but they have to be understood in their context. Uh, another thing about symbols is the Bible will endeavor to interpret them for us. So it's not the job of the interpreter to come up with some sort of an interpretation of the symbol, but to find where the scripture interprets it for us. Uh, there are a few symbols that are left uninterpreted, such as I already mentioned 666. Uh, couple guys that I listen to have different, in fact, all in the same theological tilt, they'll come up with different interpretations of that 666. Some think it's a barcode, the beginning of a barcode that will be branded with during the tribulation. Uh, others think that it's the uh, Jewish, uh, I should give you some context on this one. Um, this I think is a little more accurate uh, because it does seek to go into the Jewish context and understanding of what the symbol would have meant to its audience. Um, to multiply something or to cube something, I guess, by three is to deify it because it's represent representatory of the Trinity. So for example, 777 is perfection by perfection by perfection being the symbol or number for God. Um, six is the number of man. Um, so six times six times six would be man deified. Uh, so it's actually the dean of my college believes that this number is symbolic, but will also have a new uh, meaning during that tribulation that will be immediately recognizable as Antichrist. But the purpose behind the 666 is because uh, it will be in efforts to make a man as God. Uh, so that's, that's a possible interpretation of that but it's impossible to be dogmatic on those things because it's not interpreted for us in scripture. The best we can do is seek to understand what would that have brought to mind to its Jewish audience in the first century. And there is the possibility of multiple uses. Um, for example, stars, sometimes they're used as uh, representative of angels. We'll see that in Revelation 12, that um, a third of the stars are swept away by the tail of the dragon. And this goes back to the book of Jude, uh, when it's um, representative of Satan and his fall, where he takes a third of the angels with him. So we see angels represented as stars. Uh, but we go to the book of Luke, and we see the star of Bethlehem. Uh, that's not immediately apparent as an angel, and there's debate of whether that's an angel or astrological alignment, whether it's the Shekinah glory. Uh, so not all symbols are interpreted, and they can be interpreted differently in different places in the Bible. Uh, so we can't latch on to one symbolic interpretation and drag it into other books, is essentially what I'm saying here. Okay, last one. Hey, can so I ask a question real quick? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Where, where did the symbol six equal equivalent to man come from? Uh, that comes from, uh, I believe in the Jewish culture, that came from man being created on the sixth day. I'm not sure where that developed, but we understand that as a Jewish understanding of the number six from some of the Talmud books um, that were written between the, um, when would that have been, the fourth century BC and 84 when the Talmud was written or primarily written, uh, they had started to use that number to represent man. 
I also had read a book called Numbers, and uh, not the, the Bible chapter book, but um, they there was some reference to it being um, one less than God. Yeah. Um, a rough interpret a rough memory of what they were saying. I think that was F.W. Grant. I think I might have given you that book. Oh yeah, I think yeah, you may have you may have. Yeah, so that's F.W. Grant. He wrote the numerical Bible, which basically goes through all of the numbers in the Bible. Actually, it's I don't think he should have named his commentary the numerical Bible because he doesn't focus on numbers. But I think that's what kind of intrigued him to begin with. Um, so he'll go through and trace how certain numbers are used in scripture. Uh, for example, five is often linked together with law. And it'll be interesting because when we get to uh, different eras in history and how God used those to communicate different truths to different people, uh, we'll see that the fifth major era of scripture was the era of law. Uh, we'll see uh, the three is often used to, uh, to represent completeness, seven for perfection. Uh, two is often used for unity or division, um, but it's also the personhood of Christ. Uh, so different numbers that it sometimes gets a little too close to Bible numerology. So I try to stay away from it too much. Um, but it's obvious that numbers are used in distinct ways in scripture. And again, hey, huh? I'm sorry. Whenever you get a chance to update, you know, some of your notes, we, I'm just really, I'd like to lear, learn just a little bit more about the, the Jewish understanding of the number six. Absolutely. Uh, if there's another thing outside of JW's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, uh, I can do that for you. In fact, I just shared an article with another group the other day of, uh, that goes through some of those symbols in Revelation, like 666, and he brings it into the Hebrew letters and traces that use of, um, I believe it's the wow article in um, Hebrew. So yeah, I, I can send you that um, after class today, and then I'll see if I can dig up some other stuff as well. Cool, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so the last thing we're gonna look at for um, interpretation in the book of Revelation is actually numbers. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll read this. This again is from Roy B. Zuck, uh, Bible Interpretation. So what about numbers in prophetic literature? One writer suggests in a book where almost all the numbers seem to have symbolic value, seven seals, trumpets and bowls, etc. 144,000 Israelites, 42 months, 1,260 days, three and a half years. Should not the 1,000 years indicate a long period of time rather than a number of a calendar years? But are all the numbers he mentioned to be taken as symbols? Do they not have meaning as ordinary literal numbers? If 742 and 1,260 are not to be taken literally, then what about the reference to two witnesses in, the, in Revelation 11.3? And if 1,000 means simply a large number, then what about the reference to 7,000 people in verse 13? On what basis do we say that 7,000 does not mean a literal 7,000? And if 1,000 is a large indefinite number, do the references to four angels and seven angels mean simply small numbers? If these numbers in the book of Revelation have no normal, literal, numerical value, then what has happened to the principle of normal grammatical interpretation? How can we say that 144,000 is a symbolic number when in verse 7, 5 through 8 refers specifically to 12,000 of each from each of the 12 tribes of Israel? So this is Roy Zuck's uh, argument for why we should take 1,000 as a literal 1,000 years. Uh, another person notes that the, uh, basically that in Revelation, John is quite capable of indicating large numbers. Uh, when it talks about a large um, army of 200 million um, cavalry, uh, that's quite a large number that he uses a specific number for. But in Revelation, oh geez, 
10, I believe, when you see the saints before the throne, it says a number that no one could number. So why would he say that it's so large it can't be numbered here to mean a large number, but later on he uses large numbers like 200 million, he uses numbers like 1,000. So it seems that when he wants to be specific, he is specific. And when he does not intend to be specific, he is purposefully non-specific. Uh, I think I got another slide on this. I don't. Uh, in my notes, uh, I made a note of what my professor said. Uh, there is not one number in Revelation which is clearly defined symbolically. So we can, without doing any damage to the text, take every single number literally, and the book makes sense. But we cannot do the reverse. We cannot take every number symbolically and have the book make any sense. Um, so basically what we apply to one area, we have to consistently apply to every area. Uh, so for an undefined number, uh, if this symbol is not told to us that this is symbolic, um, then everywhere that this number is told to us that it is not symbolic, we have to do that same process with. Otherwise, it's us deciding how this ought to be interpreted and the burden of proof lies on us for uh, eternal wisdom and knowledge. So it, it makes the interpreter um, in the place of God to interpret his word. So we have to be willing to let him interpret it himself and where it's not interpreted, we either make no effort to interpret it dogmatically or we hold it with a grain of salt.